the quarterback contracts are such a highly discussed topic, right? We all love to be in other people's pockets at this time of year. Let's start with Tua, right? The the contract that like last week on the show, Joe said, hey, Tua hasn't even reported yet for camp, but or any of the voluntary stuff. He actually did show up this week. There's been conversations back of, back and forth on it. Like, where do you guys stand on two of the contract situation? Uh, we'll start with Mike. I mean, I, I think it's just inevitable that all these guys are going to get paid at this point. And there's some more stuff I can go over on the bigger picture after we talk about each individual player. But it's interesting to see how it's unfolding with the Dolphins and if they're going to be able to talk to it down at all. I don't know if you guys remember, like the Dolphins were heavy players in the Deshaun Watson market. They were heavy players in the Tom Brady market to where they got a tampering fine. Like they, since they've gotten Tua, they've basically been trying to replace Tua. And I remember when he was struggling early on in his career, they were going to the backup, Ryan Fitzpatrick, in the games. So it's interesting now the roles have kind of flipped and they, they need Tua. Their options have dwindled down to nothing for this season and who knows for the future. But they need Tua right now while they have Tyreek Hill healthy somewhat and on this team. And the, the roles are completely reversed. And they're going to have to give him this massive deal after they've been trying to kind of replace him over the last couple of years. It's one of the more interesting situations also of these quarterbacks because I think maybe maybe in the Dak situation, we're going to talk about Dak too, but with Jordan Love and with Trevor Lawrence, you're paying that quarterback to kind of lift the team, take the, the offense to the next level. With Tua, you're kind of just paying him just to do the simple things and let the talent around him lift the team. And I wonder how that's, how that's going to play into the negotiations here. But two is going to get forty five plus million, fifty million dollars, just like the rest of these guys are. Joe, yeah, the problem in, in the NFL is, is, and we've talked about this multiple times, is it doesn't matter if you're the best player at your position. If you're up for the contract, you're getting the biggest, highest co- paid at that position. So Tua, like, so Miami is arguing with that, like right now with themselves. Like Tua has been hurt. He's uh, hasn't. Maybe has been the guy that we like, and then sometimes he's not been the guy that we like. Are we willing to give him the fifty to fifty-five million dollars that it takes to be a franchise quarterback now, or are we going to go, hey, screw it, let's let's have him walk? I think another thing that's holding Miami up right now is money issue. Is they only have a million dollars until June first. June first, Xavier Howard will come off the uh, the salary cap, and that opens up another twenty-five million dollars this season which then we should start seeing the Tua conversation get a little bit more exciting. Uh, I've seen rough numbers on Tua around $200 million uh, is what they're saying. So it's going to be a little bit less than some of these bigger guys. Uh, but Miami is the salary cap, I think, is, is what's hurting them a little bit because even next year, whatever they give Tua, uh, Tua, even next year, they're already $11 million over the cap. You know what I mean? Even though we talk about the salary cap being just a myth and you can do whatever you need to, there's a reason why Miami had to let Christian Wilkins walk this year. Like you, they, they're signing all these guys, and uh, it's not working out for them. Or you know, they're just putting their money elsewhere. And Tua, I mean, a quarterback position like you should have already been winning with Tua. That's why you have. That's why you're able to spend all this money when they're on that rookie deal. But once these quarterbacks get to where they're at, that's where your franchise uh, has to start making or breaking. But I, I think. I think the Tua situation will get done because you see it on the sideline with Mike McDaniels and Tua, but are those guys connected at the hip too, right? McDaniels and Tua, like what if this is a make or break year and the Dolphins don't make the playoffs? Are the Dolphins looking to ship both of them out? Like they don't, maybe they don't want to fully commit to them. I don't think either of those guys are on the hot seat. And I'm going to say this. I think that it's the most like, interesting structures that we have that were both guys love and two were drafted in the same draft. And they're, they're eventually like they're in the same exact spot, but one organization has had essentially three starters for 30 years. And the other organization, I was going to get this list, but I'm just going to rattle off the top of my head. Feel free to chip in. If you remember some names, Sage Rosenfeld, Jay Fiedler, Chad Pennington, uh, Dante Culpepper, uh, Moore, what was it? Matt Moore played some games for them. Like uh, Chad Henney. <laughs> it's like, it has been nonstop. John Beck. Like we could go on if we could even just like sit here and think Daniel. about it. 
Ryan Tannehill, <laughs> they have been waiting for somebody that elevates – even if it isn't all the time or in all the circumstances or in all weather conditions or whatever you want to put it in, they've been waiting for somebody to elevate this way. So that's why two is going to get paid. My stance remains the same is that I believe Miami and his team will get together. Well, they will, they will make Tua look like the good guy here. They're going to make it look like, Hey, Tua came in and did like a team friendly thing because he wants to make sure guys stick around and Tua comes in around $46 million or so. But as we transition this conversation to Jordan Love, I don't think Jordan Love and his camp are going the same route in the, in like in the same direction. I think he's going, hey, I'm the next man at the, the table, and we just saw what Jared Goff got. I want to be in that, that ballpark. And I think the Packers are going to end up paying that, that kind of money. Probably. I'm with you. I think that the Packers are going to pay Jordan Love. And similarly to like what Joe's saying, it seems like the crossbar has just moved for getting this payday. It, it's moved way back. And with every position, the next guy up does get signed. But it seems with the quarterbacks, especially in recent years, with the cap number going up, they're almost like eating up the entire increase. And that's the part that's been bothering me about the quarterbacks market. Is, is the fact that they have just basically just swallowed that extra cap that the NFL keeps making for these teams through all these greedy stuff that we were talking about last week and talking about earlier on the show, like going international and putting, you know, a Red Bull thing on the kicking net when it comes up for field goals. So I, I just, I would like to see the other positions see as drastic of increase that the quarterbacks are seeing. But I'm with you, Tony. I think that the Packers, they, they do this. They, they draft their guy. They let him sit behind the previous guy. They bring him in. He has a great year, and they sign him to that extension. And I don't know because the potential on Jordan Love is probably the highest of these quarterbacks. The potential on Jordan Love is probably higher than Jared Goss, which you just mentioned. So Jordan Love's team's definitely mapping out that potential and where he can get to when they're negotiating this deal. Uh, and Josh Jacobs is going to help Jordan Love out a lot, huh, Joe? Um, or, or, um, what's his name? LaShawn Lloyd. But anyways, that's beside the point. Uh, so right now the highest paid quarterback in the NFL going into the season, according to, uh, average pay per year is Joe Burrow, right? He was taking, uh, what? Two picks before Tua? Three. Right? In the same he time? was one, two, or four. He was one, Tua was five, Herbert was six. Right, and then and Herbert is making what fifty two million, so there's fifty five million, fifty two million, and then you just put Jerry Goff right in the damn middle of both of them, which is throwing the whole damn thing off. I'm not saying nothing about Jerry Goff, but are we putting Jerry Goff in the top five quarterbacks? Like, should he be up there? Like, that's what we're talking about. Like, th these contracts are ridiculous. And Jordan Love, like you said, will get paid. Uh, Tua will get paid, and it's just like, how 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 ridiculous are these quarterback contracts going to get over over time? Tony? Like this is, it's never going to stop. Like, is there when, when are we going to see the first one hundred million dollar quarterback? Like, he's making it's going to happen. Million. It's going to happen very rapidly. I mean, just looking at it in twenty twenty one. You go back to twenty twenty one. You look at the highest paid quarterbacks. The highest paid quarterback that year, three years ago, was Russell Wilson at thirty one million or thirty two million is what I have marked down here. We're only going back. Three years in between 32 million being the highest paid quarterback in the NFL to today, we're seeing 50 plus million. And I think I looked at the starters today. If all four of these guys get signed, 20 of the 32 quarterbacks will make as much as the highest paid quarterback in 2020 and 2021. 20. So I that think is that that is unbelievable. The jump. I mean, I don't think uh, if you look at Peyton Manning's career, he probably averaged like fifteen million dollars per year. Yeah, I know that. I think it was Favre was the highest paid quarterback the one year he, the second year he came back in Minnesota. They gave him like twenty million dollars guaranteed just to like get him off the tractor and came back, and that was just a disaster of a season. But I, I think it's, uh, and I'm blanking on his first name, but that Manning at Texas, the the nephew. Archie. Yeah, Arch, Arch Manning. I think Arch Manning is going to be in that first 
ballpark of like when he's coming up for his first contract, right? So he's got another two years, three years of college football left. And then you think another four years before he's eligible. So in like six to seven years, we're going to start seeing that because there'll also be a new CBA at that point, which they're going to add an 18th game because we've already talked about the greed of the NFL. And that's not going to stop. They'll go to like two preseason games or no preseason games. And they're going to add an 18th game, extra bye week, extend the season out uh, another couple of weeks and really just own the entire calendar year. Well, there will be essentially three weeks of football from like June to mid July where they aren't controlling anything. And guess what? They'll figure out a way to do something in those times or whatever too. But I, I do think that we'll see that, but there's a, there's another little part of me where like, where do these teams eventually start going? Like, you know what? This is our offer for you. And we're not going to that level. We're not going to hamstring the organization. We're not going to, just because you're the next man up, put you above yeah. that player when we don't value you as the same way. Bucky Brooks has that had that great saying. It was the first time I'd ever heard it. Are you a truck or are you a trailer? You know, are you, are you pulling or do you need to be pulled along? And to where I do right. think that Tua can be the truck side of this analogy – I don't necessarily think that's always the case, right? And, and we've seen that. And I think there's a lot of moments where it's like that with a lot of players. I think there are very few trucks where you could say like, hey, we're going to give you 25% of our cap, but that's because we know that you're going to get us to where we need to go. Because in, in like, if we really break it down, like how many quarterbacks out there that have ever existed really are making it to the Super Bowl every year, every other year. It's a, it's a select few people. But yet, uh, my favorite quarterback, Justin Herbert, is being paid like a guy who should be taking this team. I keep hearing fans sure. go, well, lower the expectations or whatever. It's like, no, no, no. There's no lower expectations anymore. If Herbert's healthy, this is a 10-11 win football team. There is no rebuilding year when you're paying your quarterbacks this kind of money. That's the thing with Josh Allen right now. There is no sort of retooling bounce back year when Josh Allen's making $46 million or whatever. It's like train just has to keep going along and he has to figure out a way to get his team going. That's why you pay those, those people the money. Well, Herbert, yeah. it was 10 wins on a non-healthy year. He had crack ribs and half the team was out and still had 10 wins. So I'm with you, Tony. I feel like that's the worst of possible situations. You can get 10 wins there. We should be expecting 10 wins out of, you know, flash forward two years and you're getting paid five times the amount. But this is a good analogy that you're using. And this is what I'm talking about and how the, the extra cap that teams are getting, that needs to be shifted other directions. Like the New York Giants are a prime example for this. They paid Daniel Jones last offseason like he was their truck. He was the one pulling the trailer. But really, it was the guy who just left for their division rival. And that's what you freaking get. But yeah. it, Saquon couldn't get them to give him a con, give him a contract, and he was actually the truck of the offense. And it's going to get uglier than those uniforms this year. And they're going to pay for it, and they might lose their coach because of it. Why can't everybody be like Dak Prescott, huh? And yeah, say it's about not all about too. the money. It's not about the money, even though he's what Dak Prescott is making what twenty one percent of the Dallas Cowboys uh, salary cap. Like, it's, but it's not about the money, right, Dak? Never about the money. Uh, so true Cowboys fan, welcome to the show. Uh, appreciate you being in here. His comment is that Dak needs to be in the Cousins market. And I actually think that that would be the smart move for Dak if he really is in the mindset of like, I want to win a Super Bowl, right? But those type of things would have needed to be figured out before the draft, before free agency. If he sat down with Jerry and said, yeah, I'm going to take an extension, Jerry, and I want to be at 45, you know, $44 million a year, but I want to know that CD is going to get locked up. If he wanted Michael Gallup back, like he's going to be here. I want to make sure that we're re-signing Stefan Gilmore or we're going out and we're making a play for Legereus Sneed. Like whatever he needs to be involved in those, those like thoughts, not necessarily the final decision maker, but I do think there's a part of it's like, Hey, if I am, doing this thing for the franchise, I would like to make sure that like 
hey, I don't want Tyron Smith gone. Even though Smith is maybe a little bit older and can only play 12 games, guess what? When he plays those 12 games, he's really good. So like, don't let's not let him go to the Jets. It seems like Dak, in Joe's comment, he says, hey, it's not about the money. Well, it kind of feels like it's a little bit about the money. Also, I said this to these guys in a, in a text uh, message yesterday. I think there's a little bit of Dak going, if I'm going to be here and I'm going to deal with the scrutiny of being the Dallas Cowboys quarterback, I want $60 million a year. But if I'm going to go to a team and I'm going to go team up with the division rival Giants next year and Bill Belichick, and we're going to win the division and we're going to, it's going to be the craziest fun offseason conversations that we've had on this show in a long time. That would be nuts if that was the case. If Dak goes to the Giants and Belichick goes there, it would be crazy. I think he would sign a contract that's maybe a little bit more like quote unquote team friendly at $50 million a year to play there. But if you're going to play in Dallas and you're going to deal with all this, like all of it, then pay me, pay me to deal with all of the, the craziness that it takes to be the, the quarterback of the, the most popular team in the, in the, in the world, as far as NFL football is concerned. Well, that's the part where it's really confusing, Tony, is he's saying that he doesn't care about the money at all. <laughs> so he's saying, like, I'm willing to take a discount, but there's no deal done yet? Like, wouldn't the Cowboys have pounced on a discount? I think that they would have. I, I fully agree. Yeah. If he said, if it's really not about the money. And, Prove it. Because then the other thing to me is that, like, Jerry is basically saying, like, if if you don't care about the money, then we really don't want you here. Yeah, because otherwise, why wouldn't you why wouldn't you be saying like, hey, let's come to a, re a reasonable contract then at forty three million dollars. Let's get this thing done right now. And so we can start planning the offseason, uh, you know, accordingly and we can load up the roster. Now, I'm not one of those people that thinks Dallas is just going to fall off the map. I still think Dallas is one of the three best teams in the NFC this year, like even with them losing the pieces they've lost this season. That's how much talent they have. Like, they're still going to be right there. See, and I, I don't want to hate on people for what – you are worth whatever you get paid. So if an NFL quarterback is getting offered $60 million a year, take that money and run. So get that money even if, you're worth, if you think you're worth it or not. Somebody's offering you that money, you take it. But when are NFL quarterbacks – NFL quarterbacks just have to look themselves in the mirror and be like, I want to win championships over getting paid. And like you said, Tony, if it's taking $10 million off a year – and in some states, you can do it because the taxes are allow you and you're still making it. But come on, like, we've all seen the Tom Brady story. And we all know that how big of a pick that he took every single year to do what he, him and his team could do. Like, when it when you come out like Dak Prescott did the other day and say it's not about the money, I, I right off the bat said bullshit. Bullshit, because you at no point in your career have you ever showed that it's not about the money. Like, in, in, in I don't get that impression from Dak, like uh, that he's out there. I, I, I'm sure everybody loves playing the game of football, but when it comes down to contracts, you want to be the number one guy. You want to get paid right. Uh, and I, and part of me is already thinking that Dak Prescott maybe has mentally already checked out of the Dallas Cowboys. And why wouldn't you want to go test the free agent market? Like, like because you saw what Kirk Cousins did. You saw Kirk Cousins on day one get signed 160 million dollars, uh, and a hundred million dollars guaranteed, and that dude was coming back from an injury. You don't think a one hundred percent healthy Dak Prescott at the end of the year could make uh, a lot more than that on the open market? He's super wise on the way they structured this deal. The way it skyrocketed all on the last year. I mean, it looked probably good for the Cowboys at the time because they're thinking we're going to get an extension done before that last year. But the way it was put together by Dak and his agent is that if we don't get an extension this last year, I'm cashing out on the Cowboys for one. They're paying me a shit ton to play without a contract in that last season, and then I'm cashing out in the summer following if they let me walk. So he kind of put them in a corner where the Cowboys had no choice but to pay Dak regardless. There, there's just a there's so much that's up in the air with the Cowboys right now, and I think that's like what makes is going to make this season so interesting because – they do have a tough schedule. We Mike McCarthy is in a contract year, and your quarterback's in a contract year. The three most important things of any NFL franchise, ownership, 
I think that Jerry's a better owner than we give credit for. Like a lot, there's a lot of jokes made about Jerry, but I think he's a good owner. You need quarterback and you need a coach and you want those things cemented. This is the foundation of your organization. And they're going in with two of them where it's like kind of shaky footing right now. And so it is, it's, if I was a Cowboys fan, I'd be uncomfortable, but I would still be extremely optimistic. Both of these guys need to perform to continue doing, you know, what they love to do at the highest level and being compensated for it the way they want to be compensated. So like, and I think Mike McCarthy, we make, we've made a lot of jokes on this show about him in the past. I think he's a good, I think he's a good coach. I mean, if you win 12 games every year, like you're a good coach, you're, a, you might not be able to, to pull through in, in big games or whatever, but how many people he's a, are? He's the really Dave good? Roberts of, of the NFL. Shots <laughs> fired. The Dodgers fan right here. Yeah. Holy smokes. But yeah, when you put your uh, put your chips on the table, Tony, you start playing with fire. Sometimes you might get burned. And that's what I worry about for the Cowboys. If the wheels start to fall off, how many wheels are going to fall off? Micah Parsons, very outspoken guy without a contract. C.D. Lamb, very outspoken guy without a contract. We get to week 10, and this thing is completely crashing into a, the side of the road. Are those guys going to start thinking about wanting to leave with Dak? Well, they've already thrown Dak under the bus before, so what's going to stop them again? Yeah, like, are they going to start to say, you know what? If Dak's gone, Mike's gone, if we're just going to start a rebuild here, maybe we aren't the guys to get rebuilded around. Maybe we want to go and join up with one of these other super teams. And I, I really do think that the bigger these contracts get, the more these players are making, the more power these players hold, the more and more and more we're going to get like the NBA as far as player movement. And we're going to start to see some players doing some crazy moves. So I, I think that there's a little bit of delicacy that we don't really get into or discuss as fans or when you watch mainstream media of this sort of like mentally checking out. I think the guys that are well compensated and they also have their mentals on their legacy. I don't think Micah Parsons is wasting football games in the NFL when he's talking about wanting to be one of the greatest players of all time. You don't get to check out. Even in a bad season, you'll still see the greatest players like really going after it. I mean, the Raiders and Devontae Adams, Joe saw this firsthand, like Devontae was still out there competing, still wants the football thrown his way, is still going 100%, playing through concussions, some people think, on a bad football team. Because those guys know when everything gets added up and the totality of their career is being spoke on from idiots like us on the internet, they want to be remembered going, oh, this, this guy, he was the dude. He was legit. And I think the problem, the checking out, is the guys that are like, hey, man, I don't know if I want to be sacrificing my body. I don't know how many more years of earning potential I have left. Those are the ones that are, aren't worried about their sort of football legacy that you get where it's like they're half in, half out. And then you have those other guys that are like, I eat, live, and breathe this. And as soon as that whistle blows, I'm running through every wall I can. See, that's why we still get really good product even from the teams that are like out by Halloween. Yeah. Joker, what's going on, brother? How you like how you dig the new Harbaugh hat? The Harbaugh. I see what you're saying, Tony. And for a lot of positions, a lot of players, I agree, but not for receivers. I think receivers have like a pinky toe out the door at all times. I I, I just I think it depends on where you're at, who like who you are, where you know, like where you are at in your career. And I just don't think that guys that think about legacy, think about Hall of Fame, I just don't think they, they check out like that. They're just not built that way. You know who's not mentally checking out? And he's getting a lot of love this year because of the Dak Prescott contract situation? Trey Lance. <laughs> I thought you'd hear, like, when you're, all I'm reading online is Cowboys can't wait to see Trey Lance in preseason because he's going to be so good. So I don't know. Uh, that's my last thing on the Dak Prescott Cowboys things because I, I get I don't know about you guys but I get sick in the stomach when I talk about the Dallas Cowboys. It's like why are we talking about a crappy team that can't do anything and just annoying fan base? Let's just move on away from because I just want to throw up every time I talk about the Dallas Cowboys. I will say that we don't spend a ton of time talking about the Cowboys on this show. Like we don't, we, there's several, like we're leading the show. Like we led the show with Tua and over Dak in the contract conversation. We even went to Jordan Love before we went to Dak. The last person I want to talk about is Trevor Lawrence. And then we can just sort of wrap this up. 
is I think that the Jaguars are in a spot where they have to pay Trevor Lawrence everything and anything that he wants to be paid because this team cannot go back to being irrelevant. Like there's just no way around it. And I, and I do think that Trevor has shown enough to where it's like he should be in that when Trevor was healthy last year and that team was really cooking, like they, they were on the right track. He suffers a couple of really bad injuries that we all sat here going, there's no way he plays. There's no way on a quick turnaround like this, that this guy's out there. He's in a knee brace. That's looked like it's fit for like an offensive lineman, like just the bulkiest, biggest, grossest thing. And he's out there and he's winning football games. So like Trevor, I don't think the Jaguars can afford to be not part of the conversation and Lawrence keeps them in that conversation. Also too, if Trevor was tradable or on the open market, there's like five teams that would call immediately and be like, Hey, Gino, pack your bags. You know, Hey, this, you know, the next guy, pack your bags, get out because we, we want this kid in our building. The Steelers in a heartbeat would be like Justin, you know, uh, Russ hit the road, Jack. So can we finally stop, like, Trevor Lawrence is the story that we need to, like, put out there that, look, just because you have a generational talent player coming through the rankings doesn't mean that as soon as they get to the NFL, that team is starting to win. Like, remember everybody said Trevor Lawrence was, he was born and raised to play football in the NFL, to win championships, and then he gets there with Urban Meyer and the Jacksonville Jaguars. And now we're looking at his first contract to, to get it or his second contract. And we're like, should they pay him? Should they pay him $50 million? Should they put him up at the top? Like, like I, I don't know. They brought in Mac Jones this season who was drafted, what, two or three picks after him. And now you're looking <laughs> that whole draft class. He's the only one from that draft class still with his original team right now. The only one. And he's the generational talent. And they're not, it's not like they're winning games. I mean, their one big game was, you know, that playoff game against the Chargers where they came back in the second half. But that's about it. Bill Flames, I'm with Mike on the mic. What's up, the brand new one time for your mind? He gave you fair warning. Now it's time to smack him in the mouth with that raw sports talk from the town. Sweet chin music to your favorite sportscaster. 